Can you push record? And you're on. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Alfonso Santiago, and I have the honor of, pres of presenting our guest speaker. He is a Marine aviator, a Vietnam veteran, a teacher, Hall of Famer, and our hometown hero. He has been decorated with the second highest award our country gives for heroism, the Navy Cross. He also has received the distinct, has distinguished himself with the Leap of Merit and three distinguished flying cross, uh, crosses. I'd like to call your attention. It is my honor to present to you Colonel Fred L. Cohn, United States Marine Corps, retired. Thank you, Your Honor. Sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. As you were. <clears throat> Thank you for inviting me this afternoon. I've already spent an hour talking to your previous class, and we talked about two things. We never got to the third one. I'm going to briefly go over the two things, and I'd like to get to the third one to you, because, uh, Colonel, this is a history class? Yes, sir. Arizona and United States history class. Okay, well, let me kind of put my uh, emphasis on the history, not so much on myself. I was talking about goals and backup. The points I made with the other class is that you always want to have a goal. You never want to get around without having a goal because if you don't, gosh, just anything will do. And you don't want to be in that kind of situation because nothing really will do. You'll never have reached the, the goals and will never reach the peak that you want to. But always remember to have a backup because sometimes, as fate will have it, uh, you won't be able to reach the goal you started with. Uh, I gave the, and I'll just briefly tell you, I had the goal when I was your age of becoming a farmer. I was a farmer. I grew up on a farm. Uh, cows and horses and pigs and chickens and we had uh, crops of corn and soybeans. Our cash crop was tobacco. I grew up on a farm north of Kansas City in the northwest Missouri. And we grew the golden burly tobacco there, the big long leaves that they made. Uh, they, had, they were cigar wrappers, that's what they grew up for. And my father let me grow the cash crop my senior year, like some of you are, and I was really happy after I graduated, I got the crop. Uh, acre of tobacco could make you about $1,500 then. And we had a base of 15, five acres, so five times 15, $7,500. To put it in perspective, a new Chevrolet four-door automobile with all the bells and whistles on it cost about $1,800 then. It's different than it is today, but I was going to be a pretty rich kid, you know? And I was really did. It was the last week in August. I had just finished topping out the tobacco crop, which means cut the tops out of it, getting ready to put it into the barn to harvest it. And I went to bed that night. That night, the good Lord brought a hailstorm through the country. And I got up the next morning, and my tobacco crop was all on the ground. There were 50,000 stalks sticking straight up in the air. It was worthless. I collected the insurance on it, $300 worth of insurance, paid my seed bill and my fuel bill for that year, and I had nothing left. So I said to my dad, well, what am I going to do, Dad? He says, well, I've got nothing for you to do, son. He said, I can't hire you. I, we're not making enough money there. You got us. Uh, you qualified for a scholarship. Why don't you go to college? Well, I had taken uh, some tests as a senior just because another a bunch of us wanted to take tests. And so I took them with the other guys. I just so happened to ask them, and I qualified for a scholarship, but I never thought about going to college because I was going to be a farmer. And when the clock was gone, I had nothing to do. I had no backup. So he, my dad suggested that, so I did. I went to school, uh, not good bored with all that. I went through, got got to school. I will tell you about this. I uh, got to the first day of school, the registrar, and the lady at the registrar's desk said, okay, cowboy, what do you want to take? And I said, well, I'm a farm boy. I want to take farming, agriculture. She said, we don't teach it here. This is at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. And I said, well, what do you teach? 
And she said, we got an engineering course. And I said, well, sign me up for that. The reason I tell you that is that I didn't give two seconds worth of thought to engineering before that time. I just sort of picked it up. I was not good in math, but I could add two and two and get four most of the time. So I said, well, I thought I'd be able to pass engineering. And after a lot of hard work in four years of college, I was able to get through. Uh, not the very best student, but I got through. But the point in my head is, is I didn't have a backup. I didn't think it through. I should have, but I didn't. So I'm telling you that if you have a goal, always have a backup. I was lucky. I got into something that I could do, and it was all right to, for me to do that. But I, if I had picked something like English or history, uh, and, or maybe languages, my only foreign language is English. That's the only foreign language I speak, you know, so I would have never been able to do something like that. So you need to think about things. Well, I'm going to skip over that and, and things like that. I had a career in the military. I didn't start out uh, for a career in the military. Maybe that I should tell you that, too. Uh, when I was in high school in the early 50s, they had the draft. It was right after the Korean War. And so everybody had to go to the service, mandatory. Uh, we didn't have ROTC in high school, but they had it in college. So I'd take it in college. And at the end of my college career, they gave us a choice. We could either go into one, one of the services. I chose to, to go into the Marine Corps because I had a cousin that was in the Marine Corps. And so I just, you know, I didn't know anything about it. I just knew that everybody had to go. You had to spend four years. And I was going to give them a little extra time. I was going to go four years and four minutes, make sure that I had a complete thing and they couldn't call me back in. <laughs> well, I went in. I wanted to be an infantry officer. And I was an infantry officer. I won't tell you how I got into aviation, but that's another story. But I spent the four years in. I got to be an aviator, and I love flying. I got married to a, a woman that was also a farm person. So we'd both never been away more than 50 miles away from home. That's like never getting any further than do your ash fork, you know, and uh, my whole life, or both, both of our lives. And so in the Marine Corps, the Marine Corps moved us around every place. We loved it. So we just stayed in. We, we liked it so much. But it and besides, I was flying by that time, and I really loved to fly. That was a different story. But, it was, uh, uh, maybe I should tell you that because there's a lesson there. I uh, was an infantry officer. I finished the basic school, which is to train infantry officers. I had my platoon out in the field. It was February. It was wet. I was muddy, cold, and wet. I was up mud up to here. There was a guy who came to the field. Ah, he was a great big tall guy. You know, funny looking coveralls. And, uh, he said, we need aviators. If anybody here would like to try out to be an aviator, i got an airplane down at the air patch down here. I'll take you up in an airplane. It wasn't so much the airplane ride, because I had never been in an airplane before in my life, not even as a passenger. But this man was standing there. He had these funny coveralls on, and he was dry, and he looked warm. I was soaking wet. I was chilled to the bone, muddy as I could be, and I knew that he wasn't going to let me in his airplane in the shape I was going to. He was going to get me in some dry clothes, and sure enough, he did. Took me down there, and I put me in one of these funny coverall suits, dried, put me in the back of a SNJ aircraft, a, front, a, a, a training aircraft, prop aircraft, and got out there and took off. As soon as we got the wheels in the wheel, he said, okay, Cone, uh, you got it. Wait a minute, I don't know how to fly. He says, oh, it's easy. He says, you pull back on the stick, you go up, you push forward, you go down. Uh, you you want to go sideways, you push the stick over this way. You want to go fast, you throw, put the throttle forward, and go down, you pull it back. That's all you need to know. And so we flew around for about half an hour, doing all kinds of things. And he was guiding me through this. And he made me think that I was the ace of the base. I was the best aviator since Charles Lindbergh. He did some job on me, that's what he did, you know? 
And it wasn't, and, and by the time I got down, I said, this those papers, I'll sign them, I'll sign them right now. You know, I want to go to flight school, you know. And he signed me up. It was about six months later when I got to flight school, and I found out that I was not the ace of the base or Charles Lindbergh. I was just an average flight student. But I worked hard, so I got through. It took me about a year to get through flight school, and then I got out into the fleet. Um, I guess the thing I want you to learn about that is if you want to sell somebody something and tell them that and tell them they're the best and things like that, you better back it up with something, <laughs> you know. But I guess he could tell that I had a little bit of hand-eye coordination and could get through it, and, and he did encourage me to go to fly, and I did, and I loved it. I flew for 30 years, and, and well, 28 years by that time. And I loved every minute. And I still go up in airplanes and just, just love it. It's really great. A lot of fun. A lot of hard work. You know, I don't know what the colonels told you about this, but let me tell you this. It's not easy. You know what? They want you to know things when you're an aviator. They want you to know things like navigation and, and all that kind of stuff and how to handle the airplane. It's work, but it's fun. And that's the big thing thing that you want to do and what the thing you do. A lot of things that you do will be work, but they're fun and you want to pick those out. Well, I talked a lot about uh, goals and things like that. Uh, I told you that I had a, a couple of goals that I didn't make and uh, some of them I didn't have a backup for, like going to school. I just kind of fell into that and the good Lord helped me out there and then some other things. But what I'd like to do with you all is tell you mainly about this thing right down here. This word, discipline. Now, wait a minute. I know in my heart of hearts that many of you at your age think that discipline is a four-letter word that's vulgar, that's bad. But I'm here to convince you this afternoon that it's a great word. It's something that can even save your life. And I'm going to tell you a story about it. And that story happened started in Arizona. It was uh, after I had gotten into the service and I had gotten to postgraduate school and I had gotten to be an, an aviator and I got assigned to a attack squadron that had a brand new aircraft in it called A6 Intruder. Now the A6 Intruder is an airplane I call a gee whiz aircraft. A gee whiz aircraft because it can do a lot of different things. The Air Force, contemporary of the A-6, is the F-111. And you probably studied about the F-111, seen pictures of it and everything. It was an airplane that was developed by General Dynamics that could take off, fly to any place in the world on its own navigation, drop a bomb, and fly back, never see the ground. The F-111 was the first airplane that could do this, and it was a very good airplane. Well, it was an Air Force airplane. Well, the Navy was going to buy some, and then they said, nah, you know how the services are, they're competing, things like that. We can't buy another F-111. we got to have our own aircraft. So they put out a contract to the Grumman Aircraft Corporation to build the A-6. And like I said, it was a gee whiz aircraft. It was not very good looking. I don't know whether you got a picture of it. I do, right here, sir. Well, but as you can see, it's kind of an ugly aircraft in that it's got a great big nose on it. There's a reason for that great big nose, because back in the late 50s, early 60s, when it was developed, the radars they had at that time, here, here's one, an A6 landing border carrier with a hook down, things like that. You can see there, uh, th there's got, it, it, it had this great big nose on it because it had the radars out here in the nose. And I've got a lot of funny stories to tell you about that. But at that time, they needed that much space for the radars. Now they've developed radars uh, to such that they can almost paint them on the side. Not really, but I mean, they're much smaller than this. <laughs> and so it was a two place side by side aircraft. The pilot sat on the left over here, and the bombardier navigator sat on the right. Uh, it was a very uh, trustworthy aircraft, and it handled a lot of ordnance. As a matter of fact, there were five ordnance stations on it. None of them are loaded up here, but there was one here, one here, 
one on the center line where this tank is, and then there's two others, so five stations, and they had on them what they called MERGs, which stands for Multiple Ejection Racks. It was something that was developed during Vietnam. It was a rack that would handle actually six 500-pound bombs. And since that airplane had five stations on it, here's a picture. It oh, it could tear, take on these. Here's this, this is uh, the rear end of the MER with three bombs back here, and then there's three bombs up front on the on the MER too. And it was, it, it, here's the front part of it where the three are attached here and then the three back in the back. And I'll tell you what, uh, this, this airplane carried 30,000 pounds of ordnance. That's more ordnance bombs than any other airplane in the United States inventory except for the B-52. And I think they carried about 108, sir, some, some know, ungodly know. number. It was just, you know, Unbelievable, but this carried more than any other, and it was an attack airplane. It was a very good airplane uh, because it had that big nose on it with the radar on it. It had a systems in it, and that's what it's called the Gee Whiz aircraft that you could type in, just like they do on the modern airliners today, and you could type in your uh, base coordinate, uh, coordinates and then put in your target coordinates uh, half a world away, and it would point there and fly at you to it. And, and, and get you on target. Matter of fact, when we have the missions in Vietnam, just to digress a minute here, we would always tell when we come back from a mission, or check our systems out when we come back from a mission, see if it was a good system. We type in the coordinates of Cherry Point, North Carolina, which is on the eastern seaboard. That was our home base. We type in the center of the runway at Cherry Point. We'd be flying in, in Vietnam back over Hanoi, or not back over Da Nang, the base that we were stationed at, and we type that in, and if the cursors came around to a, I forget the exact heading, I think it was 082 or 83, and 10,564 miles, that was where, from where the end of the runway was, <laughs> to the center of the runway at Cherry Point, North Carolina, we knew we had a good type system. That's pretty good. It would, you know, it was a wonderful airplane, and the A, uh, I mean, the F, 111 was the same category. They were contemporary airplanes. So it was a real joy to be in that squadron. I was really uh, fortunate to get to. I was a maintenance officer, and I'd just gotten out of the postgraduate school in Monterey, and, and so they had asked me to come and be the maintenance officer there, and I jumped at the chance and really enjoyed it. The only problem was <clears throat> it was a big job. It was a hard job. Uh, but we were getting ready to go to war. This is now uh, 1965, and we had just started the Vietnam War. They wanted to employ the A-6 in the Vietnam War because it had this capability that it could go and bomb any place in the world and never see the ground. For practice, we used to take off at Cherry Point, fly down to the ranges at George Air Force Base in Florida, drop bombs at uh, George Air Force Base, and then come back to Navy Dallas and RON. And you could do that without ever seeing the ground. You didn't have to see the ground going there, you didn't have to see the target, and you'd get good hits. And you could go back and, you know, it, it had a long range. And I used to fly regularly uh, from the east coast to the west coast, uh, uh, nonstop. And you could do it about four and a half hours, you know. Uh, it had that much fuel on board. You could stay up uh, for an easy six hours if you had to which made it a good airplane for the Marines because they wanted you to stay overhead and uh, be on call. And so that's one of the reasons we bought it, it is, is that uh, it did have that capability to stay up. But let me tell you about this thing called discipline. <clears throat> I'll start my story by telling you about a deployment we went on. Uh, in, actually, it was in July of 1966. It was just before we went overseas with the squadron. We were down at Yuma, and we were uh, practicing on the Yuma ranges for to uh, sharpen our skills, accuracy and bombing and things like that, and test the airplane out. We were on winter hours. Anybody from Yuma here? Nobody from Yuma, okay. Yuma gets hotter than blue blazes in the summertime. I mean to tell you, it's a hot place. 
And going down there in July is really something. As a matter of fact, when we get in down there at the top, and you may remember this too, we, uh, the young enlisted men would complain because we'd work what they call winter hours, I mean summer hours. You started to work at two in the morning and got off at noon. They said, ah, oh, we don't want to do this, you know, you get started in the dark and you get off at noon. So the Sergeant Major would take the troops out there on the first or second day and get a couple of eggs out of the mess hall. And you gather them all around the wing of the airplane, break the eggs on the airplane wing, and they'd fry right there. They'd fry on the wing. And he says, okay, troops, this is the reason you don't work in the summertime in Yuma, because it'll fry your brains out. And so <laughs> really hot. Well, anyway, our commanding officer, he would let us off at noon, but he'd always have some little things that we had to do. And one of the things that you have to do as an aviator is to practice what's called an exit drill. Now, an exit drill is where you get into your, your flight suit, and then you put on your flying harness. And in the A6, you had six connection points. There are three places that you connect. One was right around your ankles that you connected. And the reason for that was it had two lanyards on it. And if you ever had to eject from the airplane with your feet up on the rudder pedals, these two lanyards, as you went up the rail to eject the airplane, would pull your legs back and keep you from hitting your knees and your lower extremities on the cowling of the aircraft and breaking your legs. And so that was one of them. The second one was a seat belt right around your waist, just like you have in your car, to hold you in. The third one was two straps and two hooks up here uh, around your shoulders that was connected to your parachute, which you wore on your back. Now, this really held you in very tightly because when you're going around four and 500 miles an hour and yanking and banging around in the sky, you don't want to be bouncing around that cockpit, even though you do have a helmet on, because you can hurt yourself. So you're tied into that seat very, very tightly. You've got some other things on too. You've got on an oxygen mask that's connected to your oxygen uh, dispenser over here, comes through your little uh, uh, oxygen regulator. Uh, you've got wires that go to your uh, uh, radios for your helmet to, to hear with and your mic and things like that. And you've got, and I don't uh, have it on, I just have to explain to you, you've got this flight suit on and you've got your helmet on and you've got your oxygen mask on. So about the only thing that's open that you can see is right around here and right around your mask up here. So you'll just have to mask it. That's all you can see of flesh. You've got gloves on, uh, you've got your flight suit on, everything's covered up. And the flight suits they wear now and the ones the Colonel have on right now is called a Nomex material. Nomex is a material that is fire retardant. It will burn, but it takes a long while to get it to burn. It's not like cotton or other materials that just whoop, burn right on up. Uh, so it is, really does save you if you get into a fire and you've got all this on. And of course you've got these Nomex gloves on and the helmet on and things like that. Well, you put all this gear on and then you get all strapped into this aircraft and you have this thing called an exit drill. Uh, and what it is, is there a junior man in the squadron, the PFC in the squadron, has to get out there on the wing of the airplane with a stopwatch, and he will say, go, stick the stopwatch, and then you go through the drill of let, letting get your ankles loose, your <coughs> upper face, getting all the things out. And one of the things that they do in the Navy uh, is that they have an extra bailout bottle between your legs. You pull that out and put your uh, oxygen mask in it because if you're going off the end of the ship, you can, and, and you get a, what's called a cold cat shock, you know, get enough uh, oomph to get you off that, that ship, and you go into the water, uh, you can use that mask actually as a scuba gear. Now, don't you all use it. It's not, <laughs> if you get one of those, you use a real one, but in emergency, you can use that thing and you can still breathe underwater for a little bit, you know. So anyway, that's what they teach you to do. The man says, go, clicks the watch, you have to get all these things and get out of the aircraft. There's a certain time you have to do, this is it. Maybe the, the, it's six seconds. 
Well, I was the maintenance officer, so I was the first one who had to get up there and do it, and so I did, and got to it. I said, go, jump out. And the young man looked and said, oh, gee, sir, he says, uh, the colonel says you gotta do it in six seconds, and it took you six and a half. I guess you'll have to do it again. Again? <laughs> I didn't want to do it the first time. It's 110 on the ramp. I'm sweating like, you you know, and, and everything, and everybody's down there. I said, come on, Cone, get it right, you know, get it, you know. Well, okay, I'll go back and do it. Now, this young man was just carrying out his orders. The CO said, you gotta get it in six seconds. He was making sure that I did it in six seconds. He was training me. You're gonna to have to do that someday, and you're gonna to have to make those decisions, you know, whether it's in the service or not, or whether it's just in civilian, you're gonna to have to train people to do the jobs, and you're gonna want them to do them right. Be sure that if it's something that will cost their lives or hurt them, that you make them do it right. You don't pass them off to somebody else and say, oh, well, oh, He'll, he'll learn this up the line someplace else. Don't you dare do that because you could be the one that causes somebody's death. Now, I'm old enough, older than anybody here, and I've been around enough that I can tell you that I've had instances where I've opened the paper and I've seen that old Jim Jones got killed in something or that, and I had either Jim Jones as a Marine Corps as a Marine, or I had him in school at Emory River or someplace, and I think, oh boy, I know him. I hope that I told him the right thing. He got killed. I hope it wasn't because I didn't tell him something that he should know or train him in something new. And I can guarantee you, you will have that experience. We all do. The Colonel can tell you the same. Oh, yeah. Those and your you, biggest you, regrets. It really hits your heart, and you think, oh my gosh. Did I, did I give him my best? Did I really challenge what to do? Or was I part of the reason that he died? Don't let that happen to you. So you be hard-nosed. Listen, you know, you can't be hard-nosed about everything, you know? But the good Lord has given you a brain up here in this brain bucket to figure out what's important. Now, here, I'm the oldest guy in the room, and if I have a heart attack right here, I want you all to know CPR because that's important for me to live, okay? Now, I don't want you old guys, I don't care anything, but you pretty girls, I want you to know CPR. You can give me CPR anytime. These guys are <laughs> No, but no kidding. Uh, all kidding aside, if you got something that can really hurt somebody, be sure that they know what they're doing because it cost, could cost their lives or somebody else's lives. All right, let me go on with the story. We went overseas that October, and, uh, it, and then all once now, it's March of 67. We're in Da Nang. We're flying combat hops up into North Vietnam all the time, and it's going uh, 25 hours a day. And it, it, it going. We're at Da Nang. Da Nang at that time was the largest, uh, busiest, I should say, base in the world. Bar none, Chicago, uh, Dallas, any of the ones that are busy now. They had a landing or a takeoff every 30 seconds in March of 67. It was the Air Force's biggest logistics base in Vietnam. The Air Force was on this side, the east side of the field. The Marine Corps, Navy, and Civil were over here. They had two runways, 11,500 feet each, 600 feet between them, 3-5 left and 3-5 right. The Marine Corps was up here, but on this thing, since there was a landing and takeoff every 30 seconds, there would be airplanes <coughs> lined up in what's called a queue on both sides here, ready to take off. And an airplane would land here, an airplane would come out here and take off. An airplane would land here, an airplane would come out here and take off. There were two taxiways between the runways here, and I can remember on the 24th of March, actually, 67, it was a good Friday, my bombardier navigator and I, Duke Wilson, Boog Wilson was his name, he was a six-footer, uh, Hollywood Marine, he was from California, we call him Hollywood Marines. But anyway, he was there as my bombardier navigator, and we planned our mission up to Hanoi, 
took about five hours to plan a mission because you want to know where every gun emplacement was and everything else like that when you're flying over there because you want to avoid it. So you spend a lot of time the day before planning your mission. We went to bed that night, got up about 2.30 because our uh, takeoff time was 3.45 in the morning. Got up about 2.30, got down to the airplane, pre-flighted it, uh, got in it and warmed it up, got out to the, the runway here, and uh, got in the queue and worked our way down. About 3.45, we're down here, and we get cleared for takeoff by the tower on 3.5 right. There's an airplane that lands here and comes back, and it comes down here to this taxiway uh, that goes across here, and uh, is cleared across here, a 141 aircraft. Came over here and we're cleared for takeoff. We switched to the departure control and I pour the fuel to it. We, we've uh, got run, it's in the monsoon season uh, in Dainang. Monsoon in, in South Vietnam is different than monsoon in Preston. Uh, it rains there, it rains for about six months. From the 15th of October to the 15th of April, you can almost set your watch by when it starts and when it stops. Uh, and it rains down and it rains sideways and I think it rains up sometimes because there's water all over the place. There's water on the runway and it, there's a phenomenon called the hydroplaning effect. When you got water on concrete, you got enough power, when you push that throttle up, you'll skid right over the top of it, just like you'd skid on, on and, and you can do the same thing in your car. Don't do it, but you can do the same thing in your car if you put the brakes on on a wet uh, roadway. You don't skid right out, right off the side of the road or down the road or wherever you want to do. This hydroplaning effect is a common thing. But anyway, you, I re added the power up to about 85% to get the tailpipe temperatures up on the engines and get the max power out of them. Got a thumbs up from the bombardier navigator that his radars were up and everything, and I pushed the throttles forward to 100% and started to roll down the runway. I'm kind of a nosy guy. And although it was an instrument takeoff because the, the ceiling was about 150 feet and it was raining, I look out the side of the aircraft because I want to make sure I'm still on the runway. I'm looking at my instruments for an instrument takeoff. And I, I look out the side, about 50 knots, the I am, and I see an airplane cut across here. Now, that was a common thing. They all did. They'd come across here and stop. We'd go by, they'd go in the same way down here. Uh, they'd stop as we'd go by, and then they'd move across the runway, so there's no difference there. I got up to about 100, 105 knots, and I looked out again, and this airplane that was coming across here, I could tell was not going to stop. He was going too fast, you know, and so I, my training took over like Pavlov's dog. I pulled both throttles off, I dropped the hook, to try to catch the wire, we were too far past it and I, did, and I missed it. And then I got on the brakes and I blew both tires, even though there was hydroplane, I just locked them and blew both tires and tried to turn my aircraft sideways so I could miss it. This aircraft was coming in here. Uh, I could look up, I had all the lights on and everything, and I saw the co pilot sitting in the right side of the 141, had his little ball cap on, and he was looking down inside the cockpit. Uh, like a good co-pilot should during his after landing checklist and I went right through him and through everybody in the cockpit, there were five people in the cockpit, killed all five of them instantaneously, rolled over upside down and came to rest under his number one engine. It was a 141, they had four engines on, I came to rest under his number one engine. The picture was taken that day on the 24th of March at 3.45 in the morning and here's the 141. Here's my aircraft right down here, and I'm underneath it because I'm upside down underneath the aircraft. My training took over that I learned before. I undid my straps on my legs. I did them under my shoulders. I uh, uh, did the oxygen and things like that. And then I undid my uh, waist strap, and I fell down into the top of the cockpit because remember I'm upside down underneath the one the number one engine you see the photo interpreters say that I can't tell that's my aircraft right there and there's the number one engine upside down I'm on fire I didn't know it at the time but my left leg had nearly been severed it had cut off at the knee I couldn't walk I knew I couldn't walk 
But I beat out of the cockpit, was, and, and I was crawling along in the fire. There was fire all along doing the old green crawl. I was on fire. But the only thing that was exposed was my helmet, because of my helmet and my thing, was right around here, right around my eyes. And, and I was crawling. Boogie Wilson was my bobbiter navigator uh, coming around the other side. He's a great big guy. He came into the fire and picked me up. And used, I used him as a crutch, and we're walking out. And about the time we get to the edge of the fire hall that's there, or the fire that's on there, either one of our 500 pound bombs, we had 30 of them on board, 30,000 pounds of orders, either one of those went off, or this fireball here might have been from one of the acetylene bottles. This aircraft 141 was filled with acetylene that blew up. It was fortunate because it blew us both down, the concussion blew us both down. We'd been beating on each other, trying to beat out the flames to get that out, but it blew us both down and, and it helped us out a lot there by blowing out a lot of the flame. Boo said to me, he says, I gotta go back and see if any of them are alive. I said, Boo, we killed them all, let's get out of here. And I couldn't walk without him, so he helped me uh, out. There was a Marine and a Jeep that was coming off the, the uh, side of the road there, came by, Picked us up. He got me into. I was bleeding like a stuck hog about that time because my leg was just hanging off there, and got us over to Charlie Med. At Charlie Med, they it was just like Nash. It was in a tent, just like Nash, you know. And they were coming out. It was a room about twice the size of this one, and there were three doctors coming around. I still remember. They came around. They said, mm, "Pretty bad. I'm afraid you're going to have to take your leg off." And I said, oh, please, don't take my leg off. I said, do it. He said, well, we're going to try. There's a new procedure out that we've read about. We've never tried it, but we'll try it and see if we can save your leg. <laughs> and I still remember this part of it. Uh, they rolled me over, and there was a great burly big man like about yourself came up, grabbed me, and held me back. And they, at that time, they didn't have the the things they had down, they gave you a spinal to knock you out with a needle and they put it in your back and then it deadened you and, and you went out. He was pulling me back like that. His face was right here and I'm yelling at this young man. He says, don't you let him take my leg off. I like, can do anything about it. I really felt bad about that. You know, I thought about, I should have gone back the, the next day and, or got him in there and said, I, I'm really sorry I yelled at you. You weren't going to do anything. <laughs> But they said the operation took about six and a half, uh, almost seven hours. And they saved my life. Uh, the good Lord uh, helped them. They got it back on there and put it, put it together. They, uh, the next day, or that day, it was about, uh, well, I don't know, in the afternoon after the operation, I was coming out from underneath the anesthetic. And it was in a tent again. And there was a tent pole there, I thought. But after my eyes focused, I could tell it was a human. So I asked the human that was standing there, the, he was Corbin, the, you know, was in there in the recovery tent helping everybody that's in. I says, have I got two legs? And he says, yeah, you got two legs, but one of them's awful big and funny looking. I was so happy <laughs> that I cried. I actually remember that crying. I was so happy I had two legs, you know. And uh, so I had some people that came in uh, that next day, uh, it had happened on Good Friday, and this was Saturday uh, before Easter and Sunday. Some people come in and see me because they're going to back me out, and they'd say, "Hey, come! What do you got that mask on for?" Because it was black all around here, and I said, "That's not a mask. That's me." <laughs> it broke the skin off and the eyelashes and eyebrows and everything off, and but the eyebrows and eyelashes came back in. But now the only problem I have is that I have to use Grecian formula number nine on my hair to color it the same as my brows. Now, if you believe that, i got a bridge in Brooklyn I want to sell you. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it, it, uh, it, was, it was a good thing. Now, oh, hold on, wait, guys, what time is this class over with? Uh, okay, so we have about eight minutes. Can you tell them about your Navy Cross experience, please? If you feel I will, comfortable I will, about that. I, will, I just want to make this one point. Now, okay. look, Remember I told you about that guy that had the watch and he made me do the thing? Listen, if he hadn't taught me that and if I hadn't known that perfectly, how to do that, 
I would have been a crispy critter there, okay? I wouldn't have made it out. Because in a situation like that, you don't have time to get out the handbook and study it and say, now what do you do, coach? you got to know, and you got to do it. You're going to be in situations like that in your lifetime, where you're going to have something that people are going to have to know. And I'm telling you again, you be hard-nosed with them. If they got to know it to save your life, you make them know it or you don't let them go. You don't let them pass. You don't pass them off to somebody else to hope so, or hope somebody else today. You make them know. I don't know what that young man's name was, you know, but he saved my life by making me know how to do that. If I hadn't done it and did it, I wouldn't have made it. So you remember that from my story. Colonel, why don't you let me tell you a little bit about the, the Navy Cross. Um, the Navy Cross is a, a mission uh, that's extraordinary and it's not the normal type of thing. I can only tell you certain things. Believe it or not, Colonel, some of that's still classified. He can believe it. Well, it's 46 we, years. You're on the internet. And yeah, there's Lou Abrams. He was my squadron commander. He got. You uh, guys will never need, meet anybody else who ever did a Navy Cross. You're probably the only one in yeah, Prescott. Yeah. Okay. And here's what's, what's said in here is absolutely correct. Uh, it was a mission in North Vietnam. It was. Uh, they don't tell you exactly where that uh, mission was. And there's a couple of things the Colonel can tell you about this that are different about this. Um, I had a lot of surface-to-air missiles fired at me. As a matter of fact, in the surface-to-air missiles, and the Colonel will tell, tell you this too, as long as they can see those suckers, uh, there's no problem because they have a big turn nice. radius, and yep. you in an airplane, you can beat them. You can out, out fight them. So that's what you do. But you got to see but them. That got to see them. That's the key. <laughs> if you don't see them, the ones that fly your tailpipe are the ones that are going to get you, you know, not the ones that you see. But... In this, this mission, it was a mission uh, in North Vietnam. Um, it was all over a classified airfield, and the results are classified. I don't know why they're classified, but I don't know why people classify things. I, I think I might know, but uh, all the things that, that they showed you there are uh, true. They, they all happen. The, the missiles, uh, there weren't any more missiles. Well, there were more missiles than, than most because this was a special thing. Uh, there's two things missing, and that's what's classified. The uh, target itself and uh, the BDA, bomb damage assessment, what it was. So they don't tell you that. Um, this, uh, Any lessons learned from that particular mission, or is it just that that was one that... Uh was well, a little more special than others, and you got recognition when other people could have on them also. Uh, anybody else that had been on a mission could have done the same thing I did, Colonel. Uh, I, we were all trained alike. It was not, I just happened to get picked uh, for whatever reason. I had a lot of time over North Vietnam, and I knew the target, and uh, uh, I knew the area. I can tell you a lot of uh, funny stories about that, uh, some not so funny. Uh, this wasn't on this particular mission, but I will tell you one. Uh, you could either go into North Vietnam over Hanoi two ways. You could go in over the water, or you could go in over the, uh, the uh, uh, mountains there. And uh, this one night I was scheduled to go in over the mountains, and it was really bad weather out. Boy, you couldn't see him bumping along and things like that. And all at once, the Navy comes up in their Yankee station out there where they have coverage over... North Vietnam radar coverage, and they come up and, and say, Bandits, Bandits, 25010. That meant that there were mates in the air out of Hanoi that were heading 250, and they were 10 miles from the base. Now, it's kind of funny because the North Vietnamese did not fly at night that much, and they never flew in bad weather. They were only VFR pilots. We were in solid overcast and bumping along. And I said, what are those guys doing out there? They got, must have some new training. But it was just about, uh, we were just a, a little bit shy of the target. The target that night was Yen Bay, and the, which is on the, the uh, river. Uh, and we were just, oh, I don't know, 30 miles shy of it. And all at once, it was just like a, 
those of you, you might have been in California where the fog comes in and, it, and you can almost slice it and it comes in and you see BFR, the moon on this side of it, and you can't see anything on this side and it, it looks like a curtain coming in. Well, that's what the same way it was that night. And all at once, we pop out of that thing and there's the two mates sitting right up there. Uh-oh, this is not good. <laughs> but it was a moonlit night and I could see the Red River and it comes out like a little ribbon down there. So I got down on the Red River and flew right on the river. And so these mates would do yo-yos on me. They'd come down, here I'd be down on the river, they'd come down and try to get under where they get a shot. And I was down so low that then they had to come back up. And at that time, with that technology, you had to be right behind the aircraft? Within, yes. Within two miles or so, if, if pretty tight. Up, now you could yeah, this fire is down. Seeking, seeking missiles. It's, yeah. it's older technology we have now. Yeah, so. and you had to be up, up underneath them. So they never could get it. I got into the target, dropped the bombs on the target, turned around, and headed back up toward that kite bank. I got there, and these guys are still chasing me, you know. I got there, and I went into the cloud bank, and then there was the funniest thing happened there, Colonel, I've, I've ever seen. <laughs> the lights came on, and you probably shot uh, rockets and stuff like that in, in the clouds. When you do that, boy, it's be better than a night show. The whole world lights up because everything in the cloud is reflecting. Lit, yeah. reflecting and everything. So you see this white light over everything, you know, and all at once the white light comes, and then all at once it goes yellow and then black. Now that generally means that it hit something and then dispersed, it's gone, you know. Well, these guys were chasing me in there and I don't know whether it was a thing where they were so frustrated, they just pickled off their missiles into the clouds and they hit the mountains because that was uh, up in Thud Ridge territory, the, the uh, mountains up there, or whether one of them hit the ground. It could have been either one. That, uh, did. And so, Never, never did, did know. That was probably a little bit scary there, though, it having was. them chasing you around. Have I tell it time for one more quick story? Uh, we have about three minutes, yes, sir. Okay, I'll tell you another quick story. Coming in over Third Bridge one night, and it's back, and I'm coming down the mountains. We're using that as a decoy, coming down into the mountains and coming down. And all at once, there is three football fields with a light lighting up right in front of me. Scared me. It looked just like the football field about three times as long. <laughs> And all at once, this bright light. And I said, hit the bomb in and I said, get the coordinates. If I had presence of mind and time, I'd like, drop a stick of bombs. I'm glad I did it. But anyway, I got back and I debriefed the uh, intelligence people after to come back. And I, I gave them the coordinates. I said, I, I don't know what that thing was up there, but it was really in, up in Fed Ridge and it was bright as downtown New York, you know, but it, it was a complete level field. Didn't, didn't know. And so the next night I flew and uh, uh, came back and debriefed the, the uh, young man and, and taken the intelligence to debrief. And he said, oh, by the way, the CO wants to see you. So I went into the intelligence and, uh, and the, there was a colonel. And he said, uh, I was a major by then. And he said, Major, uh, did you keep those coordinates uh, of that target last night? And I said, no, sir, I gave them to the debriefer. He said, good. He says, you didn't see anything there. <laughs> what was it? Attack on a? It was it was a base that we had up there. there it was, was a secret. safe base, a secret base. I don't know why they turned it on. We went over. Maybe there was supposed to be somebody coming they, in. About they didn't that want time. you to. They didn't want yeah. you to bomb it. No, he said, well, that's great. We didn't see anything. All right, everybody, give a round of applause, please. Thank you. I'll hang around after if you want to get any questions. All right, great. Room ten hut dismissed. Get him done.